Hey everybody, this is Aaron Harris, host of the Football Odyssey, and today I want to talk to you about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. And there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go and download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Aaron Harris, and you are tuning into the Football Odyssey. On this 50th episode of the podcast, I will be doing a long overdue installment of our football film review series. And today's movie will be the 2009 film Big Fan, starring Patton Oswalt and written and directed by Rob Siegel. Game day. Game day. Get our seats. Okay. Yeah! Touchdown! Yeah! That is the exclamation point. Hello? It's five dollars. Yeah, have fun in your box. I can't tell you how sick I am. I can't tell you how sick I am. Let's go to my boy Paul in Staten Island. He always brings the leverage. Hey, sports dog. I can't tell you. How sick I am of all these bozos. Quantrell Bishop was in your face all day long hitting a receipt. Do you mind? Yes, I do. Go to bed, Mom. Right there. Quantrell Bishop! God, I wish I brought a Sharpie. What's he gonna sign? Who cares? Let's go. Hey, we really wanted to just meet you, Mr. Bishop. We came all the way from Staten Island. Are you following us or something? No, no, we... we just want to talk, man. How long have I been here? Three days. What was the score? How do you get a concussion when you got no brains? If this animal did to you, he's got to pay. How much time could he get? Maybe three to five. Tell us everything that happened, and then we nail one so. Quantrill Bishop will not be eligible to play. I think maybe I got amnesia. Yeah, sounds like you have amnesia. Lots of people get beat up every day. I don't see you out there suing for them. None of them are my brother. I'm not going to let you do this. You're a sick boy. You know that, Paul? You need help. And you need 6,000 egg rolls to put all that stuff on. (laughs) There's basic stuff every person needs. Family, children. No, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. Where are you going? Close. Big Fan is an independent black comedy drama that follows Paul Alfiero, played by Oswald, who is a parking garage attendant and a New York Giants superfan. The film opens up with a long wide shot of Paul sitting alone in his isolated booth in the parking garage, listening to a local sports talk radio show as he writes down his thoughts and opinions that he will say on the air later that night when he calls into the show. This is a ritual that he does every night referring to himself as Paul from Staten Island. His room is decorated as if he was 14 years old, with a blanket on his bed that contains all the NFL team logos, as well as pinups and framed photos of the various Giants players and moments in the franchise's history. But most importantly to Paul, he has a large poster over his bed of his favorite player on the Giants, middle linebacker Quantrell Bishop, whose jersey number 54 is Paul's only wardrobe choice on game day. Paul and his only friend Sal, played by Kevin Corrigan, arrive to Giants Stadium on game day, walking through the frenzy of tailgates with jovial smiles not seen outside of Sunday afternoons. But since they don't have enough money to watch the game in the stadium, 
The two who regularly watched the game on a television set, situated on the trunk of the car that's hooked up by jumper cables, celebrating every big play that goes their way and flipping out every bad play that goes against them. All within the first 10 minutes of the film, we're given the sense that Paul's enthusiasm for Giants football is evident as being an obsession. An obsession that we come to find out allows him to escape his own lackluster life. Paul, as we find out in that first late night phone call to the radio station, lives with his elderly mother, a relationship that is absent of any love or heartwarming bond between the two. Paul also has two siblings who are married with stable careers and raising families of their own. Paul's disinterest in his family life is made clear at his nephew's birthday party when he doesn't sing along to the happy birthday song and he sits on the couch like a grumpy old man when his brother shows off a new low-budget commercial for his law firm that earns the praise and applause of everyone else in the family. His poor attitude escalates in a car ride dispute with his mother and highlights Paul's angry relationship with his family. What do you have against Price Club? I'm not discussing my career. You have a career? news to me. You could actually go somewhere at Price Club. Yeah, like Dennis, please. He's doing extremely well for himself. Okay. Who knows, you could probably meet somebody. What does that mean? Your brother and sister both found people at work. Yeah, Gina was Jeff's secretary. He cheated on his wife with her. It's a lot better for him than that Las Roberta. He's a cheat. He fucked her while he was still married. Don't say that word in my car. Which one? Fucked or cheat? You know. It's what he did. He fucked her. For years while he was married. I don't want that language in my car. Oh, so it's worse for me to say it than for him to do it. Cut it out, Paul. No, I want to know. Is it worse for me to say the sentence, Jeff fucked his secretary, than it is for Jeff to fuck his secretary? You should only meet somebody as good as Gina. Oh, boy, that'll be tough to top. Yeah, for you? Yeah, give me about an hour. The film's rising action happens quickly after the scene, when Paul and Sal are out, for, are out for a slice of pizza, and Sal, in disbelief, sees Quantrill Bishop at a gas station across the street in Staten Island. The two then proceed to hop in their car and follow their favorite player to his next destination, which, as it turns out, is a stop off in Stapleton to pick up drugs before ultimately leaving to go to a Manhattan nightclub. Paul and Sal, clearly out of their element, each pay the $20 cover to get in and are shocked at the $9 Bud Light prices. They take a seat in the club where they can see Bishop and his entourage in the VIP section, figuring out ways they can approach him to tell him how they are big fans of his. After failed attempts of trying to quote-unquote accidentally run into Bishop at the bathroom and sending him a drink to strike up a conversation, the two decide to go over to the VIP section. Bishop and his group at this point clearly intoxicated, laugh hysterically at their presence, feeding into Bishop's ego. Though in jest, he does go along with the small talk and listens to them talk about how he's their favorite player and even shakes their hands. Sal says they traveled from Staten Island, which flattered Bishop. But Paul makes a mistake of saying they also saw him in Stapleton, leading Bishop to believe that he's being followed and possibly being set up. Paul tries to backtrack and minimize the situation, but Bishop furiously attacks Paul, getting on top of him and punching him as he's unable to defend himself, and continues to kick and stomp on Paul as he's being pulled off him. Three days later, Paul awakes in the hospital with a swollen black eye and a shattering migraine. Paul's mother and Sal are in the room, and once Paul finds out that he was unconscious through the weekend, he has this to say. Hematoma, it's a bleeding from the vein between the brain and the skull. Fortunately, we were able to successfully drain it. So I'm going to be okay? You sustained some pretty heavy trauma, but long run you should be. We do need to keep you another few days for observation. Another few days? How long have I been here? Three days. Three days. So, so the day is... Sunday? Monday. Monday. 
How did we do? What was the score? 41-28. You gave up 41 to the Chiefs? Did Quantrell... Suspended? Yeah. For how long? It's a game by game basis. They say it depends on the investigation. Paul's journey in the movie from this point on is when he begins to encounter the fallout of the attack. His brother tries to persuade him to file a lawsuit against Bishop, but Paul will have none of it, even pinning some of the blame on himself, saying he shouldn't have approached him. On multiple occasions, he's visited by a police officer to get a report on what happened. Paul keeps brushing him off, fearing that the Giants will suspend Bishop even longer, which Paul doesn't want because his Giants are now losing without Bishop. He also calls into the sports radio show to defend Bishop, as no one listening knows that Paul from Staten Island is the Paul that got beat up by Bishop. But despite Paul victim-shaming himself, he does, in his time of solitude, feel sad and almost betrayed by Bishop, as he keeps having images of him that produces negative reactions within Paul. And even as he tries to wear Bishop's jersey again, he can't hold back tears as he lies on his bed. From here, the final act of the movie kicks off, and I won't go into detail because it's better to experience this part of the movie without any hints or foresight, but Paul goes on this personal mission, <clears throat> personal mission of sorts, and it ends up keeping the viewer hooked all the way through the end, and does it in a way that I certainly didn't expect to do when I started watching the movie. Now, Big Fan was written and directed by Rob Siegel, who originally wrote the film as an outright comedy and was inspired by his childhood obsession with sports and listening to WFAN in New York. According to Siegel, in an interview with Filmmaker Magazine, the callers on the talk radio show left an impression on him in those early years, as he said, quote, I connected with the voices I heard the same way I connected with the movie characters later in the movies I liked, end quote. Big Fan was the first script that he wrote <clears throat> and was his ticket out of the satirical news site, The Onion, where he was the editor-in-chief before growing tired of the job and wanted to try his hand at screenwriting. Big Fan caught the eye of a young, talented filmmaker named Darren Aronofsky, who was interested in directing the film, though it never came to pass. Instead, the duo collaborated on another project, The Wrestler, from 2007, starring Mickey Rourke in a comeback role as a one-time great pro wrestler who struggled to accept that he was past his prime and gradually realized how he had alienated all those who once loved him in favor of the limelight. Siegel wrote the screenplay and Arnofsky directed the film, and it was met with critical acclaim. After the experience, Siegel decided to direct a movie of his own and revisited Big Fan, which he reworked as a drama with hints of black comedy trickled in and got to work. If anyone has watched both The Wrestler and Big Fan, the film feels like two sides of the same coin, as if Siegel is exploring the same territory at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Rather than the star performer finding himself isolated from the world around him due to his own self-infatuation, it's now the lifelong spectator who has isolated himself because he never found the slightest bit of self-satisfaction in his own actions. Whereas the wrestler adopts a stage name and takes a beating in a small-time wrestling circuit to feel alive, Paul calls into a radio show as a quasi-anonymous figure to express his joys and rage and to respond to those callers who attack his beloved New York Giants. In The Wrestler, Mickey Rourke's character holds on to the past, but in Big Fan, Paul's family life implies he's a man with a past that he'd like to forget. In the end, however, the present for both men is bogged down by the past they can't move on from. Siegel said that Big Fan was to be the film that looks at sports fandom in a serious way. While Big Fan is certainly one of the few movies that does explore the topic in depth on screen, it's worth asking if this is true fandom or sheer delirium. A man refusing to press charges against his former player for the sake of winning seems absurd and far-fetched, though there is a part of me that can't say wholeheartedly that it wouldn't happen in real life. 
But regardless of the probability, the movie does have an interesting take on fandom that explores the artificial relationship between the player and the fan and just how much our team winning or losing means to us in the bigger picture, even if it's at a cost. If you look at current NFL news with the Cleveland Browns trading for Deshaun Watson, much has been written about winning and talent being more important than morale and character. Then there are the pledges of former Cleveland fans who will say they no longer support the team, in addition to the fans who say they will support the team no matter what. Will the fans who departed rejoin the dog pound if he starts winning and forget all about his legal troubles? Will those who supported Watson in his brown uniforms be at his throat if he starts losing? Only time will tell. But this is part of what being a fanatic is. It's emotionally investing yourself into something in which you'll defend or criticize other people's actions, beliefs, or words that you may not otherwise do from an objective standpoint. And this doesn't just apply to sports, mind you. It's prevalent in art, politics, and in the products we consume. Patton Oswald said that he isn't a sports fan, but that he identified with the character of Paul because of his own obsession with quote-unquote geek culture, like comic books, science fiction, fantasy, films, etc. Oswald actually made a specific example out of John Lennon when he said he was, quote, a wife, child-abandoning, heroin-using anorexic that everyone worships as his paragon of peace and brotherhood. They worship the image, despite the reality of it. And he was murdered by the kind of fan that he generated, that he wanted. It's this weird full circle thing. Not to put down John Lennon, even though I just did, because I hate him, end quote. But this fandom that we all belong to in some part of the culture or another does provide everyone some sense of belonging. When you see someone out in public wearing the same colors as you, it instantly creates a sense of unspoken camaraderie. It's this feeling that produces the phrases, we won, we lost, we have to win this game, we have to play better. The we mentality that puts us all in, in it together, even though we aren't putting on a helmet or shoulder pads. In the movie, Paul exemplifies this kind of fan that will ride or die for their team, in this case, the New York Giants. He is one of them and refers to himself as such early on in the film when they win, but as the film goes along, if you pay close enough attention, Paul begins to refer to the Giants as they after he's attacked by Bishop. As you'll see in the end, Paul's fanaticism doesn't give him a sense of community that he lacks in real life, but rather has become his life, a way of alleviating himself from his own identity. The idea of hero worship is also well on display throughout the movie. Stephen Dubner, the co-author of Freakonomics and host of the Freakonomics podcast, published a book back in 2003 called Confessions of a Hero Worshipper that explores his year-long quest to write a piece about his boyhood idol, Franco Harris, though Franco continuously dodges Dubner and leaves our author on a quest to explore the idea behind hero worship. He writes, quote, We root as if our cubbies or our stealers were truly ours, a remnant, some psychologists believe, of the time when warriors were actual genetic representations of their tribe. Recent psychological studies show that a devout fan's mood rises and falls substantially with his team's fortune. As we can see from Paul's mood throughout the film, he is glad to be alive when the Giants are winning, but sinks into a deep depression as their losing streak continues. And while it should seem obvious that his depression is solely because he got attacked by his favorite Giants player, the viewer is left to wonder if Paul is also experiencing low self-esteem because his Giants are losing. Dubner notes in the book that those with low self-esteem are more likely to experience psychological highs and lows based on the success of their team. So it may be possible that both occurrences are equal tragedies in Paul's mind. As far as what stood out to me in the movie, Patton Oswald is unmistakably the highlight. He has the sad sack presence on screen that he sprinkles in with his comedic talent that makes for a disturbing black comedy. Oswald's portrayal of a disturbed superfan did conflict with the funny scenes of the films at times, in my opinion, as Oswald's disposition left me a little too down to laugh at. Uh, but Oswald, who at this point had made his living as a stand-up comedian and as a supporting actor on the sitcom King of Queens, showed what he was capable of as a dramatic actor. Oswald didn't go above and beyond what was required of the role. He was enthusiastic when he had to be without becoming a parody of the type of person he was portraying, 
and didn't act so gloomy in the scenes away from his football fandom to the point where it felt like an over overly dramatic uh, indie film. It's often the case that the comedians make good dramatic actors because comedians use humor to suppress their own dark and painful memories. And in dramatic roles, they can just express themselves without using humor as a disguise. So even though the tone of the movie was a little uneven, Oswald did exactly what was required of him and brought out all the right emotions that resonated with me throughout the film. Which brings me to what I liked next about the movie. And it was the decision to cast Oswald as the leading man. Writer and director Robert Siegel cast the entire movie. And for a small intimate drama like this, it makes perfect sense. Seeing as the director will be working with only a handful of actors that need to carry the film, more so than high concept movies that can draw in an audience through special effects or an A-list actor's star appeal and good looks. The art of casting a movie or a TV show gets lost oftentimes because many people assume the actor's talent is so self-evident from their previous work that all you have to do is make an attractive offer to the actor and they'll accept and make the movie great. But in reality, casting directors have to have a good visual interpretation of the character they read on the page and be able to identify a person who can convey the same emotions and disposition of that character. Sometimes it's having an unknown actor do hours and hours of audition to determine if they can bring those words and actions to life in the way that the director and casting director envision. Or it's looking at a known actor's body of work and seeing potential in this role, even if it's out of the mold for that actor. For a guy like Patton Oswald, who played a character in King of Queens where he lived with his mother, he had similarities with this eventual character in Paul that prepared him to play this similar role with a much darker tone. Uh, it's almost 10. I should call mom. Tell I'm going to be late. Yeah, you're going to be very late. You're the only one who's winning. You live with your mother? Yeah, it's a pain, but she doesn't drive, so. So what if she doesn't drive? The woman can't take a bus? No, no. Theoretically, yes, but she's used to my car. All right, let's bet. I go a quarter. Who's in? A quarter is. Yeah, up a quarter. All right, let me get this straight. If you live with your mother, Arthur, it's to you. I'm very curious. If you live with your mother, what do you do when you have a girl spend the night? Okay, what do you do when you have a guy spend the night? It's got to be one or the other. A girl! It would be a girl! Uh, who hasn't been? Look, for your information, I want to move out, but apartments are very expensive. As it is, we pay seven fifty for a one-bedroom. A one-bedroom? I say, who hasn't bet? So, uh, where do you sleep? Arthur. The living room sofa pulls out, that it? <laughs> you share a bedroom with your mother? Twin beds! Twin beds! There's an entire night table between us! Easy, easy! I was just making conversation! <laughs> All right, who's not in? You, you know, I think I better be going. I have something in my eye. Could you cash me on, in? Spence. Cash me in, Scooter! Take it easy. I hope his eye's okay. So, for Siegel to pinpoint Oswald when he was figuring out Paul's voice and the decision to ultimately cast him when Oswald didn't have much dramatic acting experience was a sound casting decision. The last thing that stuck out to me was Paul's mother, Marsha Jean Kurtz. I wasn't familiar with her as an actress going into the movie, uh, but she stuck out with me. She stuck with me long after the movie had ended. She isn't in the movie that much, but the scenes that she is in, Marsha played a very innocent, good-natured woman who had a lot of depth to her that made you feel pain watching as you saw her destructive relationship with her son. She expressed a lot of pride and joy when she was around her other two children and rejoiced in their family life. But with Paul, she had a very sad and angry frustration with his decision to isolate himself from the rest of the world. Clearly, Paul and his mother have a bitter relationship. And if there's one thing aside from the uneven tone of the movie that I didn't like, it's that this dynamic wasn't explored further. The film is only an hour and a half, give or take. And I do think from a dramatic standpoint, their bitter relationship could have been fleshed out to get more insight 
as to how Paul became the alienated diehard fan that he is. There's one clip in particular in which Paul mocks his mother that really transformed him from being this lovable loser to being, you know, plainly said, a hopeless asshole. so funny. You must have the world's biggest collection of Chinese packets. It's a sin to throw out food. My mother, the soy sauce squirrel. It's a real riot, not being wasteful. You know what's a riot? Is you spending 20 years collecting all these sauce packets that you're never going to use. That's a riot. You're a sick boy, you know that, Paul? You need help. Mm. And you need 6,000 egg rolls to put all that stuff on. It's possible that the lack of the backstory coincides with Paul's desire to remove himself from his everyday life outside of football. Uh, So in that sense, perhaps it made the movie all the more disturbing not to have their relationship explained. But at any rate, I think she did a great job and I, I could have seen her take on a greater role in the movie. As far as the success of the film, Big Fan didn't break the box office as it only grossed just over $234,000. But for the most part, it received good reviews from critics. Roger Ebert gave the film three and a half stars, saying that it was one of the more thought-provoking sports movies he'd seen, and claimed that it wasn't a movie about sports, but a movie about living life vicariously. Despite the film's limited exposure upon its release, it's since developed a status as a sort of cult movie. The popular sports The popular sports and pop culture website, The Ringer, actually published a retrospective piece on the film in 2021 and said the following about its current status. Quote, these days, watching Big Fan is even more is an even more affecting experience than it was 12 years ago. People like Paul Afirio have always existed, but they've never been as emboldened as they are now. Imagining Paul, who in the movie can barely use the internet on social media, is both sad and scary. Maybe he would have been one of those guys that wants to matter on Twitter, but he just doesn't, and all he does is troll celebrities, Oswald says. The kind of guy that will send horrible things to celebrities, and when they block them, he takes a screenshot of the block like, got him. End quote. Now, Oswald's quote certainly does paint a picture of the kind of fan Paul would have been in the film if it were made today uh, and with the mountains of trolls and critics on Twitter, it would be fascinating to see Paul further exercise his alienated lifestyle by sitting on his phone for hours on end, talking shit to people that he'll never confront in real life, gaining some false sense of accomplishment. It's also interesting to hear the ringer allude to how different fan culture today is now compared to when big fan was released in 2009. Because fan culture today is no longer just filled with the people who like the team they grew up watching, guys like Paul from Staten Island. Now, there are those who cheer on individual players more than a specific team as a result of fantasy football, or because the younger audience likes watching the younger players like Juju Smith-Schuster dancing on TikTok. It's also filled with those who root for the team that will make them the most money at the sports book, even though they may not even be NFL fans. There are still plenty of old school fans who do passionately root for one team and remove themselves from fantasy and sports betting and social media, but they can't get too attached to the players they cheer for because in three or four years, they'll probably be on their way out the door to another franchise. All these elements of NFL fandom have existed to some degree or another throughout the years, uh, but the fragmentation of the fan bases and the types of fans are getting greater. And if you made big fan today, I would have to believe it would indeed look a lot different with the 13 year time jump. Before I wrap this up, I just want to say that this is actually one of the rare movies I'll review on the show in which non-football fans will like more than football fans, as there is no football whatsoever in the movie. 
It's simply a setting to tell the story of one disturbed and lonely soul. But I encourage all of you to see it anyway, and you can get it on the Plex app. That's P-L-E-X. And if you're in the mood for a mini film festival, watch this as a triple feature with two films, Taxi Driver and The King of Comedy, both starring Robert De Niro and both directed by Martin Scorsese. This may seem out of the mold, but watch Big Fan first and then these two, and I think you will see the similar approach to the uh, character study of our three protagonists in each of these films. And plus, what better way to uh, lift up your spirits by watching these three movies back to back to back. <laughs> anyway, that's a wrap, everyone. Let me know what you think of the review, of the movie, and of the triple feature. Until then, take care until next time.